Thank you all for coming, um, for taking an evening um, to join us here at UCL Bartlett. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be welcoming Mariana Mazzucato and Bill Janeway here to discuss their two books. Um, these are actually some of my favorite recent books that blend economic theory, economic policy, financial history. I've recommended the original versions to countless people, so it's great to see these two books in dialogue. I think that we're aware that one of them was published first in 2012 and the other in 2013, and now to have them both in second editions only five to six years later is really quite remarkable in terms of the amount of interest in something that might otherwise be regarded as a bit obscure. Um, but at any rate, it's an extremely important moment in which to think about the issues these books raise. And the idea that the state can play a role in fostering investment in transformative technology and in infrastructure um, by taking and allowing private investors as well to take long-term risks is something that's really quite novel in the discourse about public versus private, about austerity versus fiscal expansionary fiscal policy. This idea that the state actually has a role in fostering and structuring the way in which private investment is made is something that's genuinely original about both books. And it's interesting that they first came out at the moment they did in 2012, 2013. 2011. 2011, 2011 and 2012, just as the first wave of the financial crisis was reaching into Newman, and we were seeing the second wave in the form of the Eurozone debt crisis. Now, what I would say is that the books have a tremendous amount in common in terms of the way, the way they think about the state um, as you know, purchasing or uh, procuring technology and fostering innovation through its position that way, but also in making the kinds of investment that then allows private investors to justify taking long-term risks as well. Those are points of commonality. But there's some also some interesting points of difference. Mariana is very much concerned about critiquing what she sees as an overdrawn dichotomy between public and private, problematizing the way we think about the public sector by pointing out that it can be entrepreneurial as well, and at the same time problematizing the way we think about the private sector by pointing out that it can be rent-seeking, short-termist, and destructive in terms of the investment decision-making it makes. Um, Bill has a different gloss to a degree by suggesting that there's actually a three-player game between the state, the market, and financial capitalism that is highly contingent, that's indeterminate, that can come up with a lot of different solutions. And the pro-social solution that he describes in the first edition of his book is something that he's now come to recognize is terribly historically contingent and not the only possibility, and that there actually are far more destructive um, possible outcomes to this game, such as the one that's playing out today in the United States. Mariana's revised edition, you know, again, uh, or not really so much revised edition, a second edition with a new um, preface, is also reiterating the importance of having the state take a pro-social role in fostering and shaping the way in which the private sector makes investment and comes up with a normative version of a solution to Bill's game. So I think that these two things are, are on the one hand, very, very similar, but on the other hand, have somewhat different theoretical frameworks. Uh, Mariana, I think, emphasizes it very nicely through her um, interest in evolutionary economics, the institutional and historical contingency behind the type of public sector you get and the type of private sector you get, and her notion that the free market is not something that has arisen on its own, it's something that is actually made possible by the state, and that the institutional rules of the game for the private sector are set by the state is a really, really important thing to emphasize um, today as neoliberal economic thinking has, has kind of reached a, um, a point where it's become a you know, it's become very hollow and unproductive in terms of, of justifying any kind of um, public investment in anything and in fact suggesting that what you need to do is shrink the state. Um, Bill has picked up on some of these same themes and also points out the contingency of it. But what he's talking about is the contingency of the solutions to competition between the state, the market, and financial capitalism. And what he points out is that state failure is also possible. That um, state failure such as what we're seeing today in the United States, perhaps in the UK in the wake of Brexit, and certainly as, as is perennially the case in Italy, but pointed out most recently by the um, failure of the Italian elections to produce a stable government, is something that we also need to think about because the state as, as a, you know, is not, um, the, the state of neoliberals that, that is critiqued for being inefficient and corrupt is not the state of either Bill 
or, or Mariana, but at the same time, the state can itself be subject to capture um, and subject to rent seeking and subject to the behavior yeah, um, to, to unfortunate behavior as well. So I think that there's a lot for the two of them to discuss in terms of how these two books, which came out at the same time, saying very similar things, um, five years on, are still relevant and actually um, perhaps can be more creatively um, put in juxtaposition to each other because of the, these theoretical differences that are important but by no means incompatible. Um, what I would also say is that both of them are ultimately talking about transformative technology, about structural change, and about the type of, of, of approach to public investment that can generate long-term economic growth. Both Mariana and Bill are essentially optimists despite their pessimism about the, the current quality of public um, discourse and theoretical discourse around these issues. And you know, as the managing editor of Structural Change and Economic Dynamics, I think I'm very interested in how there are very different approaches. Um, Bill, you know, with his three-player game and, and uh, Mariana and the way in which she's rooted in evolutionary economics, can theorize structural change as something that the state is involved in and is not, is not something that's autonomous or somehow independent of the political process. So um, those are my observations about the book and their current relevance, but in a more concrete level, I think the reason that we're so happy to hold this event at the Bartlett is because both of them are talking about the kinds of transformative technologies that change your experience of the built environment, whether through the construction of railroads in the 19th century or electrification in the 20th century or you know, internet technology, um, ITC, revolution in the later 20th century, early 21st century, your experience of your world is shaped by the kinds of investments that the agents in both of their books have been making. And that is critical to us at the Bartlett. It's the reason why the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose was established at the Bartlett. And it's the reason why a school like mine, the School of Construction and Project Management, which together with EIB is a center of excellence for the study of infrastructure, is so interested in their theories as well. Because we're at the trial of an infrastructure cycle. You can see that in Britain. You can see that in the United States. There's been chronic underinvestment in infrastructure. Bridges, you know, fall apart every time there's a flood in the UK. It paralyzes, you know, um, you know six counties. It is a moment in which the state has, because of the political process, not made the investments it should in infrastructure and in the built environment. And both Wesley and Bill have provided a theoretical apparatus for changing that, for shifting the discussion around the way in which we think about infrastructure investment, both from the standpoint of the state making investments directly and from the state mobilizing private um, investors to make investments as well, to get away from what is described as public financial management and project finance and to get into thinking about more creative and more sustainable ways of fostering this kind of investment is absolutely essential. So it's a real honor to have both of them here. I am sure that both of them barely need an introduction, but in any case, I will provide one. Mariana Mazzucato, as you know, is the professor and chair um, in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at UCL and the founder and director of IOPP. She's the winner of the 2014 New Statesman's Sperry Prize in Political Economy, the 2015 Hans Mothoffer um, Prize, and the 2018 Leontef Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought. She was named um, as one of the three most important thinkers about innovation by the New Republic. And um, her highly acclaimed entrepreneurial state was one of the 20, uh, 2013 books of the year list in the Financial Times. Um, Bill Janeway also has a best book of the year um, in the Financial Times um, from the previous year in 2012. Um, he is, as I believe you know, um, someone who is a venture capitalist by profession. He spent 40 years in venture capital. Um, he was the chair of the Warburg um, Pecos Technology Investment Group. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge, is the founder of the Cambridge Endowment for the Research and Finance, along with Wesley, who's sitting in the front. Um, he also is, they, they established together the Janeway Fund for Economics in Cambridge. They are the um, uh, along with uh, Soros, the, the founders of INET, and um, Bill sits as a chair of the Social Sciences Research Council and on the um, field, the board of board for the Fields Institute. So, both Mariana and Bill um, are positioned institutionally at, at the center of these debates, and both of them are bridging academia and industry in terms of trying to understand how policy can be most pro-socially uh, focused. Now, I think it goes without saying that when you talk about um, these, these sorts of, of, of books, that it's, these are complicated ideas and need to be expressed 
um, by their authors before we discuss them as a group. So what will happen is that Bill will present on doing capitalism in the innovation economy, Mariana will present on the entrepreneurial state, they will have a discussion between them, and then we'll open the floor to questions, because we think that will be the most fruitful way of provoking discussion in the room as a whole. So thank you for listening. I was talking quickly in order to get it in within 10 minutes. I hope you didn't feel like you were drinking out of a fire hose, but if you can't <laughs> hear us, raise your hand and I'll slow people down and turn up the mics. Okay, thank you. Bill, over to you. Okay, um, well first of all, thank you very much, Damaris. Uh, the way I think about my, the trajectory of my professional life is that in 1971, I went on a 35 year, 40 year uh, sabbatical from the academy and discovered that I was immersed in playing the, a game in the frontier of innovation as a venture capitalist as the computing, as computing began to transform itself to be transformed into what we now live in as the digital revolution. And then I returned to Cambridge in uh, 2006 um, just in time for the global financial crisis to make economics a really interesting subject again. <laughs> uh, but this notion I've formulated of a three-player game really grew out of direct, lived, worked experience. Uh, the idea that I and the fellow peer venture capitalists and the entrepreneurs we were backing in the 1980s and 90s were in fact dancing on a platform that had been constructed by the United States government, centrally constructed by the US Department of Defense. Uh, of course, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, was one of the uh, constituent parts of that. But it was the US government that funded the upstream research in, in theoretical computer science, in the materials science that produced silicon, in the development of software and systems that worked at scale and under stress, and that became available, were opened up to the private sector through what today would be considered an outrageously open intellectual uh, property regime. Um, but then, along about the mid-90s, all of a sudden this other force hadn't paid a lot of attention to. We sort of took for granted that if you built a real company and it was making money, you could take it public. But in the late 1990s, this wave of financial speculation came roaring in to accelerate and amplify the impact and the deployment of all of these new technologies and to finance as well exploration, a kind of Darwinian exploration by trial and error and error and error of what to do with this new technology. So you had a mission-driven state liberated by that mission, by the Cold War, from the dead hand of cost-benefit analysis, which will always be better at evaluating costs versus benefits. And the mania, the financial speculation, the bubble, combined to produce the digital revolution. And then when I look back, historically, to the railroad age, to electrification, found the same patterns again and again of mission-driven states making investments that could not be justified in terms of their immediate, visible, quantifiable economic value, bringing these new technologies close enough to commercialization for financial speculators to come in to back entrepreneurs, again, without immediate concern for quantifiable economic value, not doing the net present value of expected future cash flow analysis that would slow down, paralyze the investment process. So that's where my notion of the three-payer game came about. I developed an observation that was fed into me by a remarkable mentor, very challenging individual, um, who used to articulate and used to present as um, uh, on pillows that he had needlepoint done, that corporate happiness is positive cash flow. <laughs> it means that your customers are paying you more than it costs to deliver them a service. And that not only validates economically that what you're doing is worthwhile, it also liberates the entrepreneur from dependence on the highly volatile financial markets. Okay, so the first 
the first wave of motivation to suggest that maybe I should go back and chew this cabbage again came with the rise of the unicorn bubble. The unicorns being private companies losing lots of money with potentially limitless growth funded by selling securities to financial institutions, public market institutions, who are taking no governance rights, no control rights, but betting on that they, begging the world not to let them miss out, fear of missing out, FOMO, on the next Google, the next Facebook, the next Amazon. That was going on, and then came the cryptocurrency, blockchain, uh, mania bubble, which requires parsing out on its own. But both of these challenged some of the messages in my book. But then I realized that in and of themselves, these were not, these were in fact likely to be quite transient, but they represented something much more important. And this was the first really strategic motivation for going back into this book, revising it, updating it, and substantially extending it. That was that the digital revolution spawned and sponsored by the United States government had taken on a life of its own. Far beyond any need for support or subsidy, it was attacking the authority of the state at multiple levels, in multiple dimensions, and what's more, with the events of 2016, the elections of 2016, it was actually undermining the integrity of the political process on which the authority of the state actually depends. So this great reversal one could see at large at the same time as micro, at the, at the microeconomic level, at the market by market level, you could see the Ubers and the Airbnbs coming in, disrupting markets, challenging the authority of the state to regulate those markets, regulatory ecosystems that evolved over generations <coughs> being disrupted. And beyond that, beyond that, the application of digital technologies to the labor market, the automation of work directly, indirectly the management of workforces by algorithm, whether the zero hour contract at uh, Starbucks or the gig players for Uber and Deliveroo. Um, and then finally, in a way the most deep level that was there for us all to see, the way that this wave of technology enabled the second great globalization, reduced the frictions that allowed for flows of goods and services and people and money that overwhelmed the capacity of the state to meet its promise to its constituents to buffer and protect them from the excesses of the market economy. So that's really what was central in thinking about this book, and then, then came the next, the next second great motivation. Because at this very moment, mm -hmm. the process that had taken a long generation from World War II to culminate in the Reagan and Thatcher rejection of the state, when Reagan said the state isn't the solution, the government's not the solution, government's the problem, I promise you that the people I was backing in Silicon Valley thought he was nuts. Without the government, they wouldn't have existed. But the delegitimization of the state as an economic actor after the transient response under enormous pressure to the global financial crisis was, was the second. The abdication of the American state today not only looks backwards at the inability to deal with the consequences of the digital revolution. It also looks forward because the United States has now formally and officially abdicated from leadership in building the base, the technological, scientific, and regulatory base for the next needed revolution, the global green revolution, as Carlotta Perez, our mutual friend, likes to describe it. The US is out of the game. And that lies, creates a third motivation for revisiting this book, which can be read in its first edition as a kind of celebration of the three-player game at its most constructive. But now, as I put it, we're living on the dark side of the three-player game. 
So at the same time, there is, it is necessary to round out the story because something else clearly over the last five years has, go, has, has come to take place, is gener has its own momentum because there is, there is a nation state with a politically legitimate mission that is aggressively sponsoring research at the frontier, especially oriented towards responding to climate change, while at the same time it struggles to manage the emergence of financial speculation and hugely increased economic dynamism and economic inequality. I don't know, you don't know, and the leadership of China does not know whether or not they will succeed in one of the rarest over the 250 years that was within the purview of the escape from the Malthusian <laughs> condition, whether they will succeed in what has only happened, one might argued twice before, the emergence of England as the leader of the first Industrial Revolution and the emergence of the United States in the 20th century as England's successor, even as Germany, positioned in 1900 as potentially the next leader, failed. The challenges of moving from being an effective <laughs> follower to an innovative leader are institutionally and culturally enormous. The institutions that get you to the frontier, the national champions, in the case of Japan, Hitachi and Toshiba, are not the institutions that are going to generate the kind of Schumpeterian creative destruction at the frontier. It is a fact that AT&T, a giant player in bringing the United States to leadership in the world economy as in, in technology, fought the scientific hypothesis, the practical technological implementation, let alone the funding by the US government of the internet. Fought it all the way from, from technical scientific meetings to lobbying in Congress. Uh, so that leaves us with a wide open question as to the state of the, you know, the state of, as I say, the, the three-player game with Chinese characteristics, which we are all going to have the chance and the need to observe. So let me conclude. Let me conclude in the two minutes I have left. Uh, because I've actually painted, I think, a, a pretty dark picture of how things have evolved. And believe me, it goes on at greater length and in greater detail. In, in, in this new edition. But the fellow who hired me at Warwick Pincus 30 years ago used to say that a venture capitalist can't survive if he or she is a pessimist. You lose the first startup, you cut your throat, you're out of the business. So I am an optimist. <laughs> I'm a temperamental optimist. And there is in one domain I see real grounds for optimism. I said that 2008, the global financial crisis, made economics interesting. In fact, to the academic disciplines of economics and finance, 2008 is the gift that keeps on giving. First of all, it has forced the reunion of these two disparate disciplines, finance and economics, whose separation played a disastrous role in enabling the processes, market and regulatory, deregulatory, that led into, that, that, that made the, the global financial crisis. But second, they also, the crisis also broke the assumptions of the rational uh, hypothesis, the rational expectations hypothesis, the notion that markets will always efficiently deliver both the, the outcome of the, the best use of resources and the fair distribution, and economics and finance are jointly exploring these areas that were kind of no-go zones for a long generation, which is why I left the academy. The issues of how do we stabilize an inherently unstable economic system on the one hand, taking distribution seriously as a public policy problem, not one that is solved by application of the neoclassical production function. 
and drawing on this reservoir of really creative research represented by behavioral economics, by network economics, that people and markets are not rational optimizing automatons. They are human beings living in social environments, never able to know enough to make decisions because they can't know the full consequences of their decisions. So with that, I would offer you the thought articulated so well by my mentor's mentor at Cambridge in 1936 in the general theory. Sooner or late, it is ideas, not vested interests, that are dangerous for good or evil. And in this case, the ideas being generated by economists and finance theorists today are, I do believe, not in the next 10 years, but over the next generation, dangerous for good. That's my optimistic closing point. Thank you, Bill. And now we'll turn to Mariana. Okay. So it is a great honor, actually, that it's happening here and with Damaris for the exact reasons that um, Damaris said. But also, I should just say something about the Bartlett, which I think is really unique. And um, the fact that there's design thinking and that the term kind of strategic design is so important in the Bartlett in terms of how we design cities and, of course, the space syntax work of Alan Penn, which is how you actually design a road and up, ends up actually affecting what happens down on that road is really important when we think about markets. Markets are outcomes. They're outcomes of the interactions between this three-player game, so right. public sector, private sector, increasingly, by the way, the third sector, if you think of what's happening out there, both in life sciences and in other areas around climate change. And then how we design both those organizations, right? Because the private sector, as we know, can have different types of corporate governance. The public sector can either be mission-oriented or really lame and just trying to be business-friendly, but also literally the interactions between them, the contracts between these different organizations, these actually can come down to design principles. And I think bringing in more of this kind of strategic thinking, and uh, sorry, design thinking in terms of the future forms of public-private dynamic collaborations that are required in order, for example, to tackle the SDGs, it's really interesting doing it in a school for the built environment. Um, when I corrected before uh, Damaris when she said 2013, it's because I actually wrote the book, the skeleton of the book in 2011 as a free pamphlet that you can get free <laughs> on the web. Not very smart if then you want to sell the same thing for some money in a bookshop. But the reason I wrote the sort of first version, which had more or less the entire argument than the book had kind of a deep dive into what actually happened in Apple and a deep dive into the current state of the green tech revolution, kind of who's financing what from solar, wind, but also fracking which, by the way, was also government finance. That's important to say, because it's not always good stuff that's financed. Um, and, and I can say something about fracking later. Um, was that this was just after the crisis, and the idea that we needed austerity, not just for the usual kind of neoliberal reasons, but also in countries like the UK, in order to grow, in order to be creative, in order to achieve a more dynamic economy, was very strong, that sort of dogma. And so I wrote this pamphlet quite quickly. Um, I think it took me about six months, <laughs> but very intense. Um, and then the book took another two years to kind of flesh out um, with the idea that, you know, hey, civil servants and hey, policymakers, if you're going to cut the state, you better actually know what you're talking about if you want to do it with the excuse of producing a more creative, dynamic, innovative economy. Ask yourselves, where does innovation actually come from? Um, and so that was sort of the motivation. Then it got published in something like 13 different languages, and the German title, I must say, was my favorite. It was called Das Kapital des Staats, you know, <laughs> the capital of the state. And I must say, I mean, I've actually just written a book on value, and that wasn't translated yet as Das Kapital, and it probably should be given, you know, the labor theory of value, but um, I thought it was such a great title, because in fact, what I'll say in my remaining uh, 13 or 12 minutes here is precisely what does it mean to think about the capital of the state, literally, in terms of an investor of first resort, not a lender of last resort, not just a fixer of markets, not just a facilitator, an enabler, all these really boring words that we use, but an investor of first resort. And all the risk taking, and, and as Bill always says, trial and error, and error and error that that implies on both sides, on both public and private. What are the implications of that? Um, 
And so first, just really quickly, um, I mean, just to say what I did in the iPhone example was really to break down all the technology inside the iPhone and ask, you know, where did it kind of come from? And the point was not to say that Apple didn't have you know, incredibly interesting people, very smart people, geniuses like Steve Jobs and Sir John Ives and others. It was that how could we then write a book, or I don't write it, but anyway, the guy who wrote the book and all the stories and the movies that are out there on Apple where not one page, not one paragraph, I love doing this, not one sentence, not one word, <laughs> sound like a preacher, um, not one word on any of the public investments that actually make that phone and all our smart products smart and not idiotic. You know, here's my idiotic phone, let me speak on it. No, so the internet, GPS, touchscreen display, and Siri were all publicly financed, not necessarily by civil servants, but the money, that investor first resort role came from the public sector. Why is none of that storytelling, the narratives, and then the theorizing around that in sort of broad public uh, understanding? And what is the danger of that then for the future of innovation, so innovation policy that then gets done kind of wrongly, thinking that all you need is VC, venture capital, but also, and this is where potentially some of our discussion might come, what does that mean for how we justify the rewards? Who, you know, how do we share the rewards given that there was actually this collective risk taking? Um, and so what I wanted to do was really to focus on kind of four, I can't remember, I have seven here, but I'm sure I'll only deal with maybe three or four, kind of big lessons for me from, um, especially around the future. Um, again, thinking about the future of innovation policy, the future of public-private third sector partnerships needed to tackle, again, climate change, the 21st century welfare state, healthcare systems, et cetera. Um, so first, just kind of basic stuff. What I describe in the book is kind of, you know, different pillars. And one of them is that this was not just about basic research being financed by the public sector. It wasn't that, you know, upstream all this great science happened in the academies, in DARPA, in the NSF, and somehow later was picked up by the private sector. Yes, that happened. But also, the role of the public sector was actually distributed across the entire innovation chain. And often, some of the most interesting public institutions were precisely those which facilitated all these, uh, sorry, I keep using my hands because I'm Italian. But I should have said that from the beginning. Excuse my hands. Um, you know, all the feedback effects between those phases. We all know that innovation is not a linear process, but do, you know, what do we know about the organizational capacity um, in different areas that actually really nurture that feedback between basic research and applied research. But the first point is really that there was a decentralized network of different public organizations along the whole innovation chain. Basic research, the NSF kind, applied research, ARPA-E kind, patient, long-term committed finance, not just the three to five year VC cycles that public financial institutions were supplying, whether it's Yasma in Israel, public venture capital fund, whether it's SBIR, in the US, whether it's an investment fund within a public bank in the KFW or the EIB, just thinking more, you know, not just US institutions, and even further downstream, the kind of stuff that Carlota Perez talks about, which is kind of bold thinking within policy institutions, even on things, you know, about how do we kind of change people's consumption patterns, right? So suburbanization did not just occur because people woke up one day in cities and said, let's go to the suburbs. There was a whole kind of policy making around that, and without that, we wouldn't actually have had, Carlotta reminds us, the full diffusion and full deployment of one other big technological revolution much before IT, which was mass production. Mass production would have just kind of remained in one part of the economy had we not had that demand side pull through suburbanization, and that as well came from uh, policy, not necessarily on purpose, oh, we need a policy to allow you know, mass production to be diffused, but there was kind of big thinking around that. And what Carlotta also tells us to think about is what would the equivalent be today, it's kind of a demand side pull to allow IT to really get fully diffused and deployed, and her answer is green. She says, don't talk about green as a technological revolution, think of it really as a huge new kind of demand pull to even allow ICT and other types of existing technologies to get fully deployed and diffused. Obviously, we also need innovation around renewable energy. Another thing is um, it actually required bold and ambitious mission-oriented organizations, the organizational capacity of DARPA, of ARPA-E, of the National Institutes of Health, which still, after the crisis, have been spending over $30 billion a year just for biotech and pharmaceuticals, 
you know, these organizations, just look at their websites, you don't need very fancy kind of metrics. They do not talk about themselves as fixing market failures. They're very ambitious. They try to uh, uh, transform the environments in which they're in. Um, and really understanding, you know, what does that mean for how you do hiring? for how you actually allow the people within your organizations to welcome trial and error and error and error, because if they fear failure, they aren't going to get very far. In fact, I once ran a conference in 2014 where I invited uh, different heads of different mission-oriented organizations, including uh, Cheryl Martin, who at the time was running ARPA-E, and she said, yeah, well, we actually evaluate ourselves within ARPA-E, which is a sister organization of DARPA in the DOE, by how much risk we were willing to take but also how much, or and just as much, how much impact across the economy our successes have. Um, and so what do we know about these organizations? Well, by dismissing the role of the state as simply being in the background, as facilitating and enabling the risk takers, we don't even do that kind of deep dive to better understand how to structure them. Italy, by the way, had a state-owned enterprise, very important, unfortunately set up by Mussolini. It was called IDI, but it had three different phases. And the first phase was the most DARPA-like. It was public but not political. Then it was public and politicized, and then it became privatized. And the second and third phases were just as disastrous um, as each other. So it was not about is it public or is it private, but how do you set up an ambitious public institution in a non-political way? And of course, people do know a bit about the DARPA model, right? They bring people in through secondment, tell them to come in, be crazy, be interesting, um, you know, think out of the box, don't worry if you fail, and then they go back to academia often, but really understanding that organizational capacity is actually why I set up the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, and we have a really interesting network called Mission Oriented Innovation Network where we're trying to share those stories, where you have the BBC, which I would argue has been a mission-oriented organization, just think of its learning program in the 1980s, which um, through procurement policy of producing these micro computers that they wanted kids in schools to use for coding, to procure those parts, they actually allowed ARM, basically the only real high-tech company in this country, to scale up through that procurement policy. So that story, but also how it did the iPlayer and also how it's been very ambitious beyond just fixing public goods, right? They do soap operas and talk shows. That's not a typical public good. They have a strong sense of public value. <laughs> what does public value mean? In economics, we don't talk about that. So the BBC story, sharing with the KFW story, public bank, sharing with the DARPA type organization in different countries. So in Chile, there's Corfo. Um, sharing with state, uh, sorry, city level agencies or Mind Lab in Denmark. Anyway, that's, that's very important to us also to set up a new curriculum that we're hoping to set up, a new master's in public administration, which would hopefully learn from those stories. Uh, um, it'll be set up in September 2019, sorry, that's when it will start, which would really kind of strengthen civil servants with the lessons about what does it actually mean to build a dynamic learning, explorative, experimental organization within the state that is trying to achieve you know, societal goals. And I'll say a bit more of that probably in the um, discussion. Anyway, then the other point is you know, this whole thing about stepping outside the market failure fixing box. You just can't imagine how radical this is, right? So how all these organizations are then judged is did they fix a the market failure? And the problem is if they also did much more than that, they're often accused of crowding out right, crowding out business. Sometimes we do have crowding out, so I don't want to dismiss that whole analysis. But what's interesting is precisely when these organizations are ambitious, when they end up doing interesting things, which actually crowd in business because they actually create new industries, sectors, but especially landscapes. So the National Nanotech Initiative was not just facilitating or de-risking or providing a subsidy to businesses wanting to do nanotech. They actually created, basically, the area, which then got industry excited. It made the animal spirits actually come about, you know, how do we actually measure that? And it's, it, it's really interesting that we at best call this crowding in, but it's still negative. It's still really negative language, right? Crowding in. We don't have a positive terminology, which by the way is why in this little pamphlet you all have of our institute, we try to transform these negative words, um, even when they're trying to sound positive, you know, fixing markets to co-creating, co-shaping, uh, leveling the playing field to tilting, for example, in a green direction. Pick the winners, pick the willing. Those few organizations that are willing to engage with a mission-oriented policy, for example, those around climate change or health, you know, to really then formulate your instruments so they're rewarding those organizations that are willing. Um, 
Right. Then I think the point where I, not so much depart, but definitely a point where we have at least talked briefly sometimes over cocktails, um, uh, is this whole issue of sharing risks and rewards. So, you know, if we actually admit that there has been this investor first resort role, which does imply failure, you know, what does that mean for how you might recoup some of the rewards on the upside to cover that downside, the failure, and the next round of investment? I don't think that's a question with basic research. You shouldn't worry about that with basic research. The spillovers just come out from having, you know, new knowledge and new opportunities for all. But precisely coming back to my first point, given that it wasn't just basic research, it was also a lot of applied research and often funds going to specific companies or specific individuals. Elon Musk, Five billion is what he got from Uncle Sam and never said thank you. You know, this is the mother in me say hey, thank you. Um, but, you know, and, and Tesla, just the Tesla S car got 465 million in a guaranteed loan. Just a little less than Solyndra got, which was 500 million. Everyone knows about the Solyndra story because it was a failure. Um, and it became the new kind of Concord story of government being basket case, you know, don't pick winners, just facilitate, just level the playing field, just correct market failures, don't be ambitious, don't do the investor first resort. Forgetting actually that what it had done was created a portfolio. There were some Teslas, there were some Solyndras, there was also some other stuff. In fact, if you read Bill's book, you'll know that basically for every Tesla success, you should expect, what, three, four, five Solyndras. So that's fine. Actually, so there was a marketing. <laughs> There was a marketing problem. They never told anyone that they also did Tesla. People just knew about Solyndra. But the second point is, fine, once you admit it's a portfolio, is it right that you, know, you had to pick up the mess from Solyndra and the taxpayer footed the bill? Yep, don't worry. I'll just stop the timer. That way it doesn't go on. Uh, no, just kidding. You went one minute over. I promise, just one minute over. Um, and got nothing from Tesla. So is it fine that we all just have these Tesla cars that we might buy? Is that the reward? Is it that Tesla pays tax? And as we know, many of these companies don't pay enough tax. Or could it be, big question, that we should also, in the future at least, think a bit more creatively so that in some cases, like in this one, it might be okay to take out some equity. In fact, Obama did the opposite. He said, if you don't pay back the loan, we get three million shares in your company. And it's like, Who's advising you? Why would you want 3 million shares in a shitty company that doesn't pay back a loan? Right. Had he said, we do get 3 million shares if you pay back the loan, the price per share went from 9 to 90. That would have been more than enough to pay back the Solyndra loss. But there's other ways to do it beyond equity. There's conditions around IPR that one could talk about. There's conditions on pricing. Why do we actually allow pharmaceutical companies to set prices, which then the taxpayer pays twice? We pay the 30 billion a year for the research and then extremely high prices. The prices themselves could actually account for that public contribution. There could be conditions on reinvestment. Many of these companies gaining from public support actually don't reinvest their profits. They do things like share buybacks. So could there be con conditions on that? Just like there was an AT&T when it set up Bell Lab. Bell Lab actually came from AT&T being forced at the time to reinvest its profits given its public subsidy. So I will stop there. I have so much more to tell you. <laughs> well, thank you, Mariana. Let's. And thank you both for your very interesting introductions to the respective books. And I think we can start the discussion here actually where Mariana left off, which is that question about how we share the rewards. And I would say actually as an historian in the first instance of public finance, I find this very interesting because the debates about taxation, both theoretically and practically, have stagnated in the last 30 years. On the one hand, you have general equilibrium models that say it doesn't matter, it just, you know, incidence doesn't matter, it's always going to be, you know, in the end reflected in wages. And on the other hand, you have notions that you know, taxation either produces crowding out or, um, or at least the public investment that comes from taxation produces crowding out and that taxation, you know, retards investment and is, is just an added cost for business that, that should be minimized. You also have a, a regime now of global tax arbitrage for all of these big multinationals that, you know, do have the, the huge corporate treasuries that in some cases rival those of many states. And you also have regulatory arbitrage alongside that in terms of this relationship between financial capital and the state and, and how um, these kinds of deals are done with public and private partners. So given that landscape, um, which provides an opportunity for firms to get the advantages of state sponsorship without you know, paying um, the, the piper when they succeed, how do we share the rewards both within a nation state and globally? So, Bill. So, uh, um, first of all, I just want to emphasize how much uh, Mariana's thinking and historical research and mine 
comp they don't just complement each yeah. other. In a way, they, they duplicate each other because we do begin with this fundamental point that Mariana just made, that in order to understand historically, objectively, <clears throat> empirically, the role that the state has sometimes played yeah. in driving economic development through technological innovation, we have to step outside of the framework constructed by the great professor of economics at Cambridge, Arthur C. Pigou, who published The Economics of Welfare in 1920, and presented the logic through which, when markets fail, principally because of negative externalities, like pollution, which the generators of do not get charged for, or positive externalities don't get created from lighthouses because there's no incentive, that there is then a role of the state to correct market failure. What we both agree on, that it hasn't been that. On the margin, from time to time, there are lighthouses uh, the, uh, that the Trinity uh, Institution in Britain has created. But it's the, big, the big strategic transformations have been driven by national missions Maybe we might someday hope for multinational missions, the Paris Accord, that transcend economic calculus, that motivate and legitimize innovation and in interventions that cannot be brought back to a net present value mm -hmm. calculus. There we agree completely. Mm -hmm. I probably emphasize more in the historical record <clears throat> the way that the state was not led and orchestrated by the sort of public entrepreneurs at DARPA in the 1960s and 70s, but rather as with, in the case of the building of the transcontinental railroads in the United States, mm -hmm. were co-opted by brilliant railroad promoter entrepreneurs whose great talent was on securing as it turned out, on the order of 9% of the entire land mass of the lower 48 states mm -hmm. to subsidize the construction of the railways, which they then proved to be absolutely terrible at running. They all went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. But we were left with the tracks, and that's a really important lesson. Yeah. And it has to do with this financial role, because this financial bubble mostly, mostly, bubbles focus on assets from, from Tulip bulbs to bitcoins with no economic use value. Forgive me, that's an offline discussion for those of you who are long Bitcoin and are betting on it, replacing <laughs> state fiat-based currency. Um, but occasionally, it's only been occasionally, that they focus, speculators have focused on these transformational technologies. And that both, and this is where I want to come back to where Mariana ended, that both accelerates and amplifies the impact, the commercialization of these technologies, but it also creates, can create, extraordinary returns. Back in the 60s and 70s, the sharing of the returns was largely through this aggressively open IP regime. Mm -hmm. If you took money from the government, you had to license your patents on a fair and non-discriminatory basis to your direct competitors. If you sold stuff to the government that really mattered, you had to put a second source into production so that if you screwed up, the government would not be left high and dry. Those notions all got lost in the Reagan administration. When, and this was a crucial moment in the life of DARPA, at the same time as the PC was making the commercial market more significant than the military market, DARPA was told in 1982, you must justify every grant by its military relevance. Mm -hmm. Before that, they never had to do that. They could really be entrepreneurial in their funding for very long-term potential returns that could not be quantified. So I do agree mm -hmm. very much that we need to consider a range of alternative ways to share the benefits mm -hmm. of these kinds of state investments that prove to be the trials that actually work. But I'd close by saying, right now, this is not a big problem in the US. There are no state investments that we have to worry about. Mm -hmm. RPE, we know Cheryl Martin, and we think the world of her. When she was there, RPE was being funded, even under Obama, yeah. at one-tenth yeah. the scale mm -hmm. of DARPA. Mm -hmm. Very limited, very limited mandate. 
And the, um, uh, today, I offer you, if you want to think, why do I call it the dark side of the three-player game? Very simple. Open up Google, type in the letters OSTP, Office of Science and Technology Policy, mm -hmm. and you'll have alternatives. You can go to OSTP.gov, which is the website as it is today, or you can go to OSTP.ObamaArchive.gov, and that's the way it was on January 19th, 2017. It's page after page, that one, of initiative, programs, conferences, everything you would hope to see government sponsoring at the frontier of science and technology. Go to the new one, the current one, and you have one dead screen, full stop, no links to anything. Oh, on that note, um, <laughs> I think we'll move to Mariana's reply then. Sure. So um, first of all, let's see. So you're not allowed to answer if you're above, let me see, this is, well, anyway, 40? <laughs> no, so the, the students in the room, let's see how many people know what the top marginal taxation rate was, so what the richest of the rich paid in the US under President Eisenhower, and he was not a communist, he was a Republican <laughs> military general, in the year that both NASA and DARPA were founded. Wow. No, 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 I said. <laughs> <laughs> how old are you? Okay, sorry. Okay, you? <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah, actually, more. I think it was 91. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So. As much as, and I, you know, I mean, I, I've been working quite a bit with people like Dick Nelson and Roberto Mazzolini, who really have been talking a lot about the IPR model and the way they, by the way, phrase it really quickly just to get people understanding what we're talking about, is that if you want productive entrepreneurship, not unproductive entrepreneurship that Baumol talked about, you need patents that are weak and narrow. Instead, we have patents that are really wide and really, really strong, so yeah. not easily licensable. Right. And we're increasingly, we've done quite a bit of research on this, increasingly patenting upstream, so the tools for research yeah. are being patented. We're literally going back to the medieval ages, a world of secrecy. Ironically, at a time that everyone talks about big data, open innovation, you know, all this stuff as if we're all sharing, you know, no. <laughs> we are patenting the tools for research. That's so very new, and that's what that wide thing means, as well as strategic patenting. So that stuff is really important, but also tax, in theory, was one of the ways that you know, these returns came back. And I think there the point is not just that um, taxation has changed massively, but also that how it has changed has been, and, and this is what I document in the book, um, lobbied for through storytelling, through narratives, by particular actors who kind of made a buck out of pretending the state didn't have this role. So it's not a coincidence that capital gains tax in the US, which people like Piketty pick on as being one of the sort of drivers of high levels of inequality, was reduced by, um, I think it was 40% in five years between 1976 and 1981 in the US, from 40% to 20%, and then fell even further, lobbied for by the National Venture Capital Association, okay? Um, and as much as we all like Bill, there's other VCs <laughs> that don't talk like Bill that just say, you want innovation, you want the knowledge economy, reduce my tax, completely ignoring you know, what we've told you, which is actually VC, and, and Bill Azonik has really shown this in some of the work we've done also together, VC has always followed this kind of mission-oriented, ambitious public financing. But you know, both the capital gains tax, but also things like the patent box policy, which is really, literally, the stupidest policy ever, because patents are already monopolies for 20 years. There's no reason you, as a policymaker, should be worried about increasing the profits even further from that. Instead, what the, the patent box does is reduce the taxation on the profits being generated from a 20-year monopoly, right? So that was lobbied for by particular companies, including uh, GSK through, again, this narrative about we're the innovators. You know, you want more innovation, then you give us the patent box. So it's really actually incredibly important to, you know, go after and debunk these stories and then show the correlation between those and then how taxation has changed, right? Um, but the other, I mean, just quickly, when I said before, you know, Bell Labs, it's such an important story, the Bell Labs story. And there's a great book called um, The Ideas Factory, yeah. which actually doesn't tell this part of the story, but it's still a great book. Um, but first of all, that it came out of AT&T being pressured to reinvest its profits. This in an era of record level hoarding, 
both in the US and in Europe. Conveniently, it's two trillion, actually it's more now, uh, dollars in the US and two trillion euros in Europe, just being hoarded, so inert capital, um, but also record level financialization. You know, so again, Bill Lazonic's work has shown that just in the last 10 years, the Fortune 500 companies have spent three trillion just on buying back their shares to boost their stock prices, stock options, surprise, surprise, executive pay. And sometimes that's fine, but the, the amount of share buybacks is sort of what he uh, looks at. These are failures of negotiation. These are kind of, you know, you could put contracts in place that say, okay, you want to live in a free market, then you can't have any of this public subsidy or public investment. You want to actually access this 30 billion of NIH funding, the SBIR patient finance, the DARPA kind of technology, well, at least make sure you reinvest the profits you earn when you piggyback on it. And I talk, by the way, about surfing the wave, and you talk about dancing on the platform, so we both tried yeah. to you know, come up again with stories around this, but we can do that. There's no reason we can't. And that's also what I mean by pick the willing. You don't set up a public bank, for example, and just you know, hand out money. Or you don't do industrial strategy and do a life sciences strategy where you just give money to the pharmaceutical companies. In exchange of what? What is it you want the pharmaceutical companies to do? So another way to think about this return is by really being clear on what the missions are. And so we've, we've actually have written a report for the European Commission on missions, and it's been circulated and it's currently driving um, 100 billion euros of uh, research, science, and innovation funding in the commission, because it had to be voted on by the council, blah, 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 which was great. But the idea there is that you can still really learn from the stories that we tell, where you have government setting a direction, saying we're going to go after climate change, transforming that challenge into a mission, transforming then that mission into a way for lots of different sectors to interact, invest, and innovate. But if you have, for example, then instruments in place, like a public bank, you don't just lend to steal or give out handouts to the steel industry, you help steel transform itself in order to satisfy that mission. So this is what the Energy Vende policy has done in Germany, where steel has, in fact, transformed itself by lowering its material content through repurpose, reuse, recycle. It received patient strategic finance to do it from the KFW, but that's very different from steel or coal in the US today just getting a handout to do nothing. And so how to actually really engage this public-private partnership yeah. to be a real partnership, symbiotic, mutualistic, not parasitic and predator-prey, just talk to any biologist, you know, ecosystems can go either way, is, is, I think, important. And part of it is first recognizing that the state can be transformational, but then asking, what are we transforming? Because yeah. sometimes we do also, you know, wars are funded, as we know. Um, again, fracking, I mentioned before, was financed by the state, and it's it really interesting that the debate about fracking only happened afterwards. Only after geologists and others started saying, hey, this stuff is a bit dangerous, that's when we started to engage the public in it. But if it is tax funded, should, and, and this is actually a question, I'm not always sure about what my answer is because I worry about referendums after yeah. <laughs> Brexit, so I wouldn't necessarily have a referendum on this, but how do you really engage civil society also in the choices of what to be spending these massive billions and billions yeah of state-funded uh, spending. Well, on. It's also how, how, you, how you spend it. Um, one reason yeah. why it's, I, I think, in fact, it's, it's um, almost dangerous to generalize from DARPA, mm -hmm. because DARPA, DARPA really was a, a unique institution during its first 20 years, 25 years. Um, its program managers, indeed, cycled back and forth between public and private sector, and to an extent, the academy. But they saw that their mission was both to define really long-range strategic programs, but then to refuse to be captured by the giant companies, by IBM and AT&T in particular. And in fact, to sponsor and support the emerging new companies, the Intels, vintage 1967, uh, and protect them from the giant companies. And they used their procurement power. That is, they, they also had another factor, which again, RPE, the energy side, sure didn't have. They had these big brothers. And big brothers were called the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. And they could migrate programs as they moved from being pure to applied research into actual working technology into a procurement contract that would pull the vendor down the learning curve to the point where the stuff was reliable enough and cheap enough to be available to the commercial market. That dynamic is a, you know, it's a very special moment in historical time. No doubt it was under the 
overall rubric of the fact that there had been that, you know, quote, you know, we won the war because of the public-private partnership as the arsenal of democracy. Um, by 1980, that story had been superseded by Milton Friedman and Bob Lucas and the University of Chicago School of Economics and was not available, has not been available to draw on. And that's why your work is so important and the fact that it has been picked up in 14 languages. Mm -hmm. I just hope it would be picked up in at least three of the American languages. <laughs> Can I just say one quick thing? Um, once when I spoke to the head of, um, actually the chief scientist in Israel who actually runs Yasma, he said, yeah, and of course we're doing what you're saying. Of course we make markets, we shape them, we don't fix markets, all that stuff. But let us pretend that we're yeah. fixing markets. Just let us talk that talk and no one bothers us. Yeah. So this is one of the things. Absolutely, this is not about cutting and pasting DARPA, but it is learning about certain things that happen in DARPA. It is learning about certain things that happen in Yasmin, SBIR, and Kotfel, KFW, etc. And, and Part of that learning process and the sharing those stories to then get reflected in theory, right? So philosophers have this concept of performativity, um, that, that how we actually judge the performance of things actually then feeds back into what actually happens in certain areas, which then feeds back into how we talk and theorize about them. This is absolutely the case. So the more we can actually explicitly talk about what actually happened within these organizations, which were absolutely different one from the other, both sectorally, but also in particular you know, phases, and what's interesting is Reagan, by the way, because you've mentioned him twice, what I say, my preface is Reagan actually didn't do what Trump is doing. Trump yeah. is going after the organizational That's capacity right. of these organizations. Yeah, He's absolutely. going after ARPA-E, that even though it has a really small budget, it's still a really dynamic organization. You walk in there, you get you know, goosebumps. Trump. He's, he's smart. I mean, people really have to be careful. He is actually a smart guy. He's surgically going after the organizational capacity. You don't kill the state by cutting its budget, because budgets come and go. Theresa May spending, you know, Trump is spending on walls and you know, things no, like that. No, he's not, thank he's God. He's going <laughs> after the organizational capacity. You kill the BBC, you kill the NHS, yeah. you kill the Open University, you kill ARPA-E. It mm -hmm. can take 50 to 100 years for these organizations to actually come back to the full strength they were. I mean, probably not 100, but you know, many decades. Yeah. Whereas a budget, next quarter it can come up. And I actually think the left hasn't understood that point mm -hmm. because we don't have enough engagement with the progressives, if you want, around the world about this whole kind of, you know, let's understand about organizations, let's really kind of, you know, change those narratives that are, anyway, yeah. I've talked yeah. enough, but. No, no that's, that's, that's right. And, and thank you both for be, being yeah, so cordial in, in, in the debate. That was great. I would say this reminds me of a Twitter meme I saw cool. yesterday that said, um, those who think that the state cannot pick winners have no problem extending that uh, picking of winners to immigration, yeah. which is right. indeed one of the places where the state, particularly in the US and, and, and UK, thinks it can pick winners, even the Trumpian state or, or Theresa May state. But that said, I want to open the conversation up to everyone else and um, please raise your hand and introduce yourself, ask your question and I will repeat it. Um, and I think in general with a debate like this, because the students have taken time away to come, let's start with the students first and then the more senior people. So I will pick the students first. Go ahead. Um, all right, first of all, thank you all for such an amazing presentation. It's so enthusiastic. Um, my name is Susan, and I'm studying uh, policy studies and education at UCL IOE. And my question was with regards to the fourth industrial revolution. I know some people think that it's more of a, just like a hype that's going on, but honestly, it is impacting a lot of things that are coming up, and it's becoming um, part of the policy mobility that's going on around in the government, um, something like the digital revolution when it came along and everyone became like mission oriented, let's invest in, in, in all of the things that are required and then it, some of the things don't really have a return on investment. So, but with regards to the policy networks that are involved in this uh, fourth industrial revolution, when they are integrating or trying to integrate the private sector and the public sector through those policy networks, how are they also prioritizing the civilians' needs and the civilians' priorities rather than their own private sector priorities? Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Okay, yeah, no, that is clear. I think I would restate the question as a two-parter. One, is the fourth industrial revolution real or is it just hype? And then secondly, the various state organizations that are tasked with setting policy around 
um, fostering the fourth industrial revolution, how do they end up prioritizing civilian interests or for that, in, in that sense, a public interest over the interests of the private parties that they're using as partners? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take the, certainly the first part. Um, it's real, but transformational technology doesn't present itself and, and deploy itself as one uniform wave front. We all know, you, we, you guys I'm sure know about the notion of the logistics curve, mm -hmm. the, the ogive which takes years and years for the new technologies to get deployed. And there's a very, very good example of this that we're living with right now. It's called the productivity puzzle. How can we have all this stuff out there all the internet and smartphones and productivity is slowed to negative in the UK. Well, the OECD, an organization for which I have enormous respect and which is doing great research, and the Bank of England have both gone out and do very detailed granular surveys. And what they're showing is this gap, an enormous gap that opened up over the last 20 years between the best and the rest the top 5 to 10% of companies and their productivity and, the, and the, 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 the rest who are just beginning to learn how. In brief, we've seen this movie before. Same thing happened with electrification. The great Paul David, historian of technolo technology, wrote an article called The Computer and the Dynamo in response to the great economist Bob Solow, who said we can see computers everywhere except in the productivity statistics. He said that 25 years ago. Um, and the same thing could have been said about dynamos in 1900. It takes a long time. What we're seeing now, what's going to accelerate the fourth, with, with, with consequences that are gonna be very disruptive and require enormous public policy, creativity, which we're not going to see in the United States except possibly at the state level. You may see some, uh, you're certainly see, likely to see more in Europe, more on the other side of the channel. But what will accelerate it is, quote, cloud computing, which is the, think of it as the an analogy to the electricity grid. In 1900, if you wanted to make, take advantage of electricity, you had to buy your own dynamo and hire your own electrical engineers from Imperial or from MIT. There weren't very many of them. Today, then you could just plug it into the wall by 1925, 1930, although in Britain you had to know which plug to use. That's another story. It may have something to do with Britain losing leadership in the innovation economy. Um, the cloud resources delivered by Amazon and Google and Microsoft are serving the same purpose. And it will enable the rest to catch up even as those companies, the digital giants that are accumulating all our data and learning how to extract meaningful value from that data in the narrow economist sense may actually continue to move ahead. But I think the fourth in industrial revolution is very real. I Thank would you. turn over to, to yeah. Mariana, Mariana on the yeah. question Please. of policy networks and trying to deal with this. Well, yeah, and also um, just to say that one of the reasons I um, asked Mike Bracken to come join the Institute, which is actually a department here at UCL, um, as a visiting professor and also to be on our board, is precisely through what he did when he was running GDS, Government Digital Services, and actually um, setting up what later became gov.uk which is a digital platform for the government, which, by the way, initially had been outsourced to Serco, one of these uh, <laughs> private, very parasitical companies, to be honest, when you look at what they actually do, whether it's in prisons or, you know, they're not producing very high-quality results but charging government quite a bit. So in that case... Sorry? Rent-seeking and facilities management. Absolutely. Right, absolutely. Um, so Serco did such a bad job that it was the iPlayer people in the BBC who again, in an organization that historically has invested in its in-house, even R&D, they've had an R&D department, they you know, again invested in BBC Micro and iPlayer, but also were very ambitious in how they understood public value. That iPlayer team were like, oh my God, we'll do it. So they moved over to GDS run by Tom Lucemore, Mike Bracken, and Ben Terrett. And what, what Mike says is that because you know, we wanted to produce a public digital platform, it was fundamental for us in building it to start thinking, you know, what is the citizen? Is the citizen a customer 
a client, just yeah. think of all the terminology that we hear, you know, the user. NHS now sees patients as clients, or a user. And they said, they're a user. And how they designed that platform was always, they, have these, they had these posters everywhere pointing outside, do it for them, you know, that's who's gonna use it, they are gonna use it. So seeing citizens as users and not customers or clients, which is, by the way, not so much market failure theory, but public choice theory and new public management, which is taught all over the world, which teaches us to think of citizens as customers and clients, it teaches civil servants to think of them that way, was fundamentally different from how they built that digital platform. That means we can do the, the technology behind the fourth industrial revolution also in completely different ways depending on how we understand citizens. But just to give you another example, you know, everyone talks about big data, but there's choices being made on what to apply it to and what not to. So if you live in this country, you'll know something called the bedroom tax, which was like the least big data thing imaginable. You know, how many bedrooms do you have? How many children do you have? Is one number bigger than the other? Yes, oh, gotta move neighborhood, right? So, all the data that we actually had on those people living on estates, because there's lots of forms you've got to fill out, you know, what schools the kids go to, whether they have autism, whether they've, you know, even been knifed, or, you know, I mean, you have all sorts of information on the families. That data could be used to make wiser choices about housing, but we don't do that. We apply it to things like personalized medicine, and where, which has really benefited from the power of big data, which is great. I mean, there's no problem with that, but there's, again, strategic choices being made to apply the force of technology in some areas and completely ignore it in others. Okay, well, thank you. So another question, uh, gentleman in the front. Hello, uh, my name is Quinda Cafense and I'm a, I'm a policy uh, maker who is here on sabbatical from Canada. I'm actually at the Bartlett doing space syntax and looking at sort of the material uh, and configurational aspects of, uh, of cultural innovation. And so I work in cultural policy, which is something that you guys haven't really touched on as much, but uh, Mariana, you talked about it a bit with respect to the BBC, uh, their cultural organization. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's a really fascinating time to be engaging with cultural policy because of the way that the knowledge-based transformation of, the, of, 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 of economies has moved uh, culture from something that's peripheral in the economic development picture of a city to something that's actually quite a bit more central in terms of the way that it uh, is able to retain knowledge-based workers and, and, uh, and, and be a lead for, for the way that the city is sort of developing its economic prosperity. But the way that culture has grown uh, has been as, some, as something that was peripheral and has always had to really justify its existence in a number of ways uh, as it's been able to, as it's pushed, you know, its own mission forward, and it's actually quite a, a mission-oriented uh, area of policy in general, because uh, it's not only about public good, but it's about uh, it's about also creating innovative products, and it's no uh, it's no uh, coincidence that Canadians are at the top of the music charts all over the world. We have a strong public funding system. Uh, and an innovation system for developing artists. So people like Drake, The Weeknd, Justin Bieber, all have been connected through this factor system, which develops artists and develops international music products. And so I'm just curious uh, about any of your thoughts at all about the way that uh, culture can benefit uh, from this kind of thinking. Because in my experience, it has been uh, cultural uh, policymakers have been really at the forefront of actually driving a lot of innovation uh, in, in, in cultural productivity. Uh, but I just didn't see it really covered in, in, in either of your books, and it's something that I'm obviously here working on and, and, and thinking about. And I, I really do think that a lot of your work uh, mm -hmm. can translate to that area of policy as well. And I'm wondering if there's any thought about sort of the impact of culture mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and how it, it's, it can play a role in driving, okay. driving innovation. Great. Just briefly to restate the question, given the fact that the cultural policy is a successful example of mission-directed um, policy and investment on the part of at least some states, like Canada, with respect to the performing arts, um, what, and given that, that the cultural policy is a spear for innovation by states, how does the question of cultural policy relate to the work of both of these authors, and what might they suggest could be done to, to make cultural policy more mission-oriented? In the U.S., um there really was only one direct experience of cultural policy as an explicit policy. It was during the Depression. It was the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. It was because artists and writers were starving, and they produced public art of extraordinary quality. 
every once in a while at the state and local level in the US, but much less at the national level. It's been renewed. At the national level, we did have a moment back in the 60s when the national endowments of the humanities and the arts were created, underfunded, always subject to assault by those who, for <coughs> ideological reasons, religious reasons, cultural reasons, because it wasn't their culture, uh, sought to, um, well, to, to delegitimize, to liquidate those institutions. Um, in a much broader sense, however, there has been this continuing argument in the US that, on the one hand, pits the kind of, and this is a cultural archetype, the yeoman farmer, the independent entrepreneur, the coal baron who, when challenged by the progressives in a, in a political, uh, in a congressional inquiry in 1900, said, God gave me my coal mines. That versus a much broader, uh, a much broader sense that we're all in it together. May I offer you a book, a, a great book, that has also just been reissued in its second edition. <laughs> it's written by the, uh, Pitt, the, the um, Mellon Professor of American History at the University of Cambridge, Gary Gersel. It's called American Crucible. And it's a extraordinarily nuanced, rich evaluation of these two competing notions of nationalism that have danced with each other throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. The inclusive nationalism represented by the Statue of Liberty. And that inclusive nationalism that we thought, briefly, had won in the 2008 presidential election versus, versus the racial nationalism that has continued sometimes less visible beneath the surface, rendered beyond inappropriate, and then resurfaces viciously again and again and again, as it did in 2016, as it did in 2009 with the birther, the birther challenge. So I, I, I suggest that to you as a reading of very much how to think about culture in the context of the American state, of the American political process. Yep. Um, so in IFPP, we, we have um, a lecture series actually being hosted at the British Library right now. Unfortunately, we didn't put up. Yeah, it's great. You should um, just look on our website. You'll know everyone who's speaking. But we have musicians like Brian Eno, architects like Richard Rogers, and Amanda <laughs> Levitt, who just did the courtyard for the VNA. Um, and on our board, actually, we also have Cornelia Parker, a great artist kind of helping us think from the cultural sphere, you know, what do we mean by public value? For example, if something's free, just because you can you know, walk into Granary Square in front of the St. Martin's Arts College there, it looks really nice and public, there's fountains, my kids play there all the time, but it's private, right? So what does it actually mean, for example, to have also really a public space that is really also designed for the public versus thinking that just, some, you know, just because something is free, Google's free too, that that somehow creates a public sphere. So how do we really create public realms driven by public value and public purpose? Um, anyway, so we're having that debate through the lecture series, so I really welcome you all to engage with that. But I think your question is, is, is really deep because it goes both to what happens within organizations, the creativity within them, and what we can learn from the cultural sphere. So it's not a coincidence that Apple you know, had musicians who helped found it, that Steve Jobs, you know, in that great book that ignored all the public thing, it did go into some things in detail like his calligraphy classes. Um, and this is really important, actually, because around the world, I definitely see this in my country, Italy, in the name of innovation, we're doing the opposite. We're actually, in, in, you know, telling kids that, oh, what you really need to do is take entrepreneurship classes, you know, as if Steve Jobs ever took an entrepreneurship class. You need to code, and by the time they learn how to code, there's probably a whole new type of coding. Cutting then things like philosophy classes, this is in Italy, um, cutting music classes, cutting some arts classes, so actually sacrificing yeah. the cultural areas, like, it's always the same, it's always music, art, and, um, but also this idea that somehow philosophy is the problem in Italian education. They're, the head of the business 
um, organization called Confindustria actually once made a statement saying the problem in Italy is that our educational system is still based on the Renaissance. There's too much arts, there's too much you know, philosophy, there's not enough you know, English and coding and entrepreneurship. And it's actually exactly the opposite. When you look at some of these organizations, what led to creativity was their ability to think out of the box, engage in these very you know, weird interdisciplinary kinds of um, conversations that required this much broader yep. kind of training than we think today okay. when we think of you know, what's going to drive the uh, okay. innovation yep. amongst the youth. So the gentleman in the very back first. Thank you, Pratik Butch, um, a civil servant. Um, I'll say that carefully. Uh, and formerly of this parish. And I'm sort of interested um, in your thoughts around the fact that parts of the public sector, particularly around the city levels, perhaps, get the idea of risk-taking. They get the idea of crowding in and, and applying design principles. And other parts, large parts, are still wedded to the dead hand of the cost-benefit analysis. Could you look forward five years, please, and tell me what needs to change inside government so that government and wider society unlock the benefits that you've spoken of? What do we need to do differently? Okay, uh, to repeat that question, why is it that some parts of the public sector are locked into the, the dead hand of cost-benefit analysis and others are willing to take risks? Um, and to look forward five years, how do we shift the attitudes in the, um, the former? Now, I'm going to actually take three questions and okay. then have them respond, because otherwise this isn't going to work. So, um, I know the gentleman in front of me has had his hand up before, so if you go ahead. Uh, thank you. My name's Johnny. Um, I'm neither an economist nor an academic, so I'm slightly intimidated to ask a question, but I'll do it anyway. Um, so, I guess my question is about the role of local government, because that's where I work, um, and who broadly tend to be at the sharp end of market failure, you know, whether it be tackling issues related to homelessness or um, children's social care, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, what role, but also potentially has a very different relationship with citizens than national government would. Uh, what role can local government play in adopting this slightly more creative, generative approach uh, to things? Um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Yep. So to, to reframe that question, how can local government become more mission oriented? And then finally, the, the lady in um, pink, who's got her hand up. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Nina, and I actually work for one of the biggest financial institutions in the world. Um, but my background is actually in psychology. Um, long story. But my question is actually related to the concept of public value and what is good for society. Um, so as a former psychologist, it strikes me that there is this sort of obsession with quantification of everything. And to the gentleman's point about culture, we seem to forget that it actually boils down to human experience. And my thinking is, is there an opportunity to maybe uh, introduce cross-pollination of ideas with psychologists and neuroscientists, et cetera, and actually understand ourselves a bit better, and then therefore being able to create a better society? Go ahead, well, Bill. The, no, I just say the concept of public value. Yeah, and, and uh, public value. Since Mariana's new book directly answers that question, I'll talk about the first two questions Fair enough. that have come about because I know Mariana will have a lot to say about the excessive quantification of value. Um, but first, with respect to what the dynamics within public sector institutions, I don't think there's any substitute for that rare phenomenon, leadership that can shape and change attitudes. This goes right back to the cultural issue. And I realized, I was thinking, you know, culture, innovation. Well, you know, thinking about China, I went back and reread my way into what happened in Britain in the first half, the public, in the public sphere in Britain in the first half of the 19th century. 1815, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain, England at least, I don't want to get any Scots angry, England is run by a corrupt oligarchy that is exercising national authority in intimate partnership with a religious establishment that reaches down to the most local level. It's enforcing what was called the bloody code there were more than 100 felonies punishable by death or transportation. Choose one. And its legitimacy was based on the fact that you could look over your shoulder 
And within a generation, just across the channel, you saw what happened when the public opened up, when you let the public out, the, the, the terror in Paris in 1792. A long generation later, between from the Great Reform Act of 1834, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, the, the radical Tory Cobbett always referred to the government as old corruption, both capitalized, old corruption. It's a great term. Well, then comes the Great Reform Act, the repeal of the Corn Laws, the Northcott Trevelyan reforms of the civil service, which essentially expel rank corruption from central government. And you have the first sort of law-abiding, say at the time when the US is very corrupt, I promise you. So that kind of cultural, evaluating that cultural transformation clearly goes with some kind of interdependence, with the economic energy that the state was trying to restrain. And that's the kind of issues that I think help us think about China today. Now, so when you think about how did the state change in Britain, how did attitudes change, you, know, you have the role of people like, like um, uh, uh, Robert Peel, of um, uh, the uh, Chartist leaders, um, um, Bright uh, of the radical Whigs. These people play an enormous role. They're, they're cultural as well as political entrepreneurs. In the US, of course, we think of Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt as playing these, these transformational roles. With respect to the role of local government, well, in the US, we really have to pay attention. We are dependent on local and state government to be addressing issues that the Trump administration, and at least until November 2018, Congress are not going to be addressing. And at some, there are things that can be done at the local level. When Franklin Roosevelt was governor of the state of New York in 1928, and there was a rock rib conservative, free market, libertarian, Republican administration in Washington, New York State experimented with all sorts of social programs and was there to be responding to the impact of the Wall Street crash, uh, crash and, the, and the depression. In Britain, and this is something I defer to those who are much more knowledgeable, clearly the scope for local government, the tax base, the resources, I mean, what we see is the impact of austerity liquidating local government, the services provided by local government just when they're most needed. Mm -hmm. But I speak as you know, a resident of Cambridge, which is hard to complain compared with what's going on in other parts of the country. Okay, great, thank you, Bill. Uh, Mariana, if you could. Yeah, so first, just on the first question, we've just done a workshop uh, for the Treasury, and we're doing now one for Bayes precisely on that. Um, on your exact question, in five years' time, we'll have had our MPA, MPA up and running for three years, so hopefully we'll have solved that problem. But what the workshop was on was how to do things differently, and we actually broke it down into three things. So what actually does a market-shaping, market-creating framework look like in terms of evaluating the policies? It's not enough just to say, be ambitious, co-create. What does that literally mean for then how you then evaluate, as the Treasury does? Um, you know, so, so what does that mean? You know, instead of doing net present value and cost benefit, what do you do? And that second point actually is precisely on that by actually trying to, um, and it sort of addresses your point too, how do you both qualitatively and quantitatively uh, measure the degree to which you have actually created public value, which includes things like, you know, the Concord plane is not flying, so it's obviously a commercial failure, but all the spillovers that occurred from that investment in other sectors, you know, did we ever actually bother to look at that? And the answer is no. There's actually no study that's looked at the spillovers that occurred from an investment that was on, you know, flying a plane. Now, you can imagine in the cultural sphere, again, just think of the soap operas and talk shows that the BBC does, it's really hard to quantify the effect that um, has if you are just thinking of it as a public good fixing thing, which at best you think documentaries and high quality news. And the third bit is the macro multiplier. So, you know, I think we all kind of agree that what we're talking about probably would have a bigger effect on the economy than just doing a road here, a bridge there, you know, the infrastructure kind of fix. Oh, interest rates are low, fund infrastructure. A bit of housing, a bit of bridges, a bit of roads. What happens if you do it within a more visionary policy of a green transformation of a country? What kind of infrastructure? What kind of roads? What kind of new 
technology might be serving that, we're trying to look at, using Sarefa's writings actually, uh, at the super multiplier. So how can macroeconomic analysis actually better pick up some of this cross-sectoral, cross-actor kind of investments that come when you have these mission-oriented policies. At the local government, you know, local governments have really, especially city governments, really practical, sorry, was you, right? Really practical problems around transport, around sewage. And what's interesting is if you think of them as missions, right, going to the moon and back again in a generation was not just aeronautics. It required at least 12 different sectors to innovate, including clothing. You couldn't go to the moon in jeans and a t-shirt. Think, and, and then all this bottom-up experimentation, so the instruments of policy used to really nurture in different ideas, including through prizes, um, the equivalent for a city, right? So if you really want to have, you know, I don't like the word smart city for all sorts of reasons, that Dan Hill, who used to teach at the Barley, now he's, well, he's with us now as a visiting professor and again on our board, talks about, as, as a problematic term, but just think of all the interesting talk about mobility, you know, as a challenge. How do you actually really get lots of different sectors tackling the mobility challenge within a city? And then again, the instruments that policymakers have to really bring in all this new kind of creative thinking. Cities are the best place to do that. It's actually much harder to do at the national level. And lastly, on public value, I mean, that's such a huge question um, in terms of the psychological component, which, to be honest, I don't know. But I think why Bill mentioned my book, the new book, The Value of Everything, is what I do is I unpick a big revolution that happened that even many economic students don't realize because we no longer teach history of economic thought in many economics departments, that there was a big change from having a theory of value um, that then transformed into theory of price. So theories of value used to be related even in Adam Smith to understanding how division of labor, technological change, conditions of production occurred and that transformed into a theory of, of, of price and exchange to a theory of price and just because something has a price, it must have value. And ironically, just in terms of the psychology, it's that second one actually that is much more subjective. So in theory, we are actually giving attention to preferences and in individuals, but by completely delinking it from a structural understanding of you know, the division of labor, technological change, organizations, how they work, and the structure of production, interestingly, we've actually ended up giving less attention to the kind of issues that you're probably interested in, even though an economist would say, oh, we talk about psychology all the time. We talk about preferences, and that's what's determining prices, and that must be value. Okay, well, thank you. I think in the last um, uh, remaining two or three minutes, I'd like um, Bill and Mariana, respectively, to summarize in a minute what they would like you to take away from this discussion. So, Bill. <laughs> well, I would say, I would say that um, I think that the framing the evolution, evolution, of the world in which we live as it has been for generations driven by technological innovation in terms of the three-player game of what's going on in the public sector, in the state, what's going on in the financial markets, the source of funding, and how do they impact the working, the day-to-day -day workings of the market economy is a useful way to think about it in while recognizing that it's as unstable, as undetermined, as the three-body problem in physics. We had a constructive configuration in the post-World War II generation, what the French call les trente glorieuses. It shifted in the US, I think it may also, I, I speak as a resident, not a citizen, let alone a subject in Britain, but I think it's shifted in a negative way in this country. Um, and we can, we're going to see how it plays out uh, in China. But I offer that as a frame for parsing and evaluating what you're reading in the papers, what you're experiencing at the counter, what, you, you're, what, what, what is going on in the place where you work. Thank you, Bill. Mariana. Um, I think it's actually just written on the front page of our institute, which is that if, in fact, you take what we've been talking about um, as kind of historically true, which is about value having been created collectively by collective risk taking uh, by different types of organizations. So not just in business, which is the usual uh, story that we're told, like in the Apple story that I mentioned. Um, what does that then actually mean for how we create future value, literally in terms of the collaborations that are needed, the kind of contracts that we structure? How do we nurture it? Right? How do we actually nurture it organizationally? So this whole problem that I've already mentioned of outsourcing, you know, what does that actually mean when the public institutions are actually outsourcing their brains increasingly? Or you know, to the extreme then privatizing 
themselves. What does that then mean for these collaborations? But also this third thing, because it's created, nurtured, and evaluated, how do we evaluate these kinds of investments that we've both been talking about that have absolutely been fostered by thinking outside of this market failure box and being willing to do what Steve Jobs told the Stanford um, graduating class in 2005. He said, if you want to innovate, you have to be hungry and foolish. What does that actually mean within the policy process? How can policy be hungry and foolish? And are policymakers today allowed to be as kind of crazy as Kennedy was when he said, we're going up there, we're going to the moon, it's going to cost a lot of money, we'll probably fail, but it matters. Those equivalent problems today around the climate, around health, can, would we actually allow a policymaker to say, it doesn't matter, it's going to cost a lot of money, but it's going to have huge impact, so let us do it. That kind of being hungry and foolish also within policymaking is a big question um, that I think we have to answer. Thank you, Mariana. And I'd also like to, to thank both speakers, um, both for their stimulating insights and thoughtful discussion, but also, I think, more profoundly for enacting what they've described. Because what we've seen here is that they've been really listening to each other, to each other, to their comments upon each other's presentations, and to the audience. And I think it's really only by listening that you can mm -hmm. actually change the conversation and shift the debate. So let's thank mm -hmm. Phil and Mariana. For well, thank you. And thanks for that. And Damaris.